and there we go. So um, our portion today is Va'era, and um, it's the second portion in the book of Exodus. If you're following along in Eitz Hayim, which is the uh, Chumash that I have, uh, we're on page 351. Whatever edition of the Torah that you're using, you're looking for Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. So as we do when we uh, study Baruch HaTadonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Shekichanu B'mitzvotah, V'tzivanu La'asok V'divrei Torah. Um, as we saw in the book of Genesis, <clears throat> there, are, there are portions that begin uh, not at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, it's um, deceptive in the way the portion is uh, presented in the Chumash. You'd think that we're starting a new subject, and we are studying, starting a new subject, but clearly when it says verse 2, what happened to verse one of chapter six? And that's in last week's portion. So as I, as I have said in Genesis, when we saw this um, occur there a few times, the portions are divided by the rabbis, chapters and verses were inserted by the church fathers separately. So Chumash now published post middle ages incorporates how the church fathers divide up the Torah or the Bible into chapters and verses and how the rabbis divide it into Torah portions. So we have a combination of the two and we only, they, uh, they only, um, we only see the discrepancy sometimes between chapter and verse and Torah portion in uh, as this week's portion points out. So if we just keep our finger here on 351 and turn to the end of last week's portion, we'll see what the context is. Uh, so if you turn back to page 340 to the end of chapter five, whatever edition of Kumash you have, just turn to the end of chapter five. Um, you'll see that uh, Moses returns to God uh, to talk to God about how uh, in verse 22, then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh Lord, why did you bring harm upon this people? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt worse with this people and still you have not delivered your people. So uh, in other words, uh, at the burning bush, which happened in chapter three and chapter four, Mo uh, Moses is assigned as leader of the people and um, is given the mission to go to Pharaoh with his brother Aaron. Welcome those who just joined us. Uh, to, uh, given the mission to go to Pharaoh with, uh, with his brother Aaron to uh, get the people of Israel freed uh, from Egyptian bondage. So Pharaoh responds by saying, no way. And uh, despite the signs that Moses does, you know, throw, this, throw his walking stick on the ground, it turns into a serpent, other signs like that, uh, the Egyptian magicians are able to uh, replicate those, uh, those signs themselves. And, uh, and Pharaoh as punishment for Moses and Aaron daring to come into their presence, his presence, he says, I'm gonna make the work even harder for the Israelites. Now they have to gather their own straw. So this is what Moses is saying to God here. Why are you making it worse for the people? What am I supposed to do? Chapter six, verse one, page 341, the very last verse of last week's star portion. Then the Lord said to Moses, you shall soon see what I will do to Pharaoh. He shall let them go because of a greater might Indeed, because of a greater might, he shall drive them from this land. Okay, so uh, here, chapter 6, verse 1, the beginning of God's response to Moses. By Yomer Adonai El Moshe, right? yud heh vav -He, and I'm pointing that out specifically because of what we'll see in the beginning of Va'era in verse 2. Adonai says to Moses, now you will see that which I will do to Pharaoh, I'm translating literally, 
because with a mighty hand, uh, he will uh, be, uh, he will send them, and with a mighty hand, he will drive them out of his land. That's how last week's portion ended. This week's portion begins, Vayedaber Elohim El Moshe, Vayomer Elav Ani Adonai. So it looks like it's a new topic. God was just speaking to Moses in sentence one of chapter six. So God is continuing to speak to Moses, sentence two of chapter six. But Vayedaber Elohim El Moshe, Verse one, Vayedaber Adonai El Moshe. So is it a different God, a different name? That is, it, it says, as I've said before, uh, sometimes rabbis say, uh, the, the, the rabbis of 1800, 1500 years ago, the rabbis of Midrash, uh, of the rabbinic commentary from that period of time in Jewish history, they will say sometimes something uh, Blair, uh, like, uh, 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 I don't, what's the word for it? It kind of projects itself uh, with, with, um, uh, with, uh, uh, I can't speak today. The words are not coming from my head. Um, something that just sticks out uh, and uh, says, Darshani, interpret me. So if verse one, God is Vayedaber Adonai, and verse two is Vayedaber Elohim, whoa, why is that? Why did God's name change from Adonai to Elohim? And then go back to Adonai at the end of the verse. God, Elohim spoke to Moses, and he said to him, I am Adonai. So um, the... Uh, Yes, thank you, Susan. I, I don't have a thesaurus here. Uh, she sent me a direct message glaring. Yes, that, that, is, that is one of the words I was looking for. I appreciate it. So um, yes, feel free, anybody, to just type in a chat for a, a word that I might be, uh, you know, that is just on the edge of my, uh, of my mouth. Um, OK, so uh, here uh, we'll look in the commentary for why this is. If we look below the line where it says, I am the Lord, uh, there on the bottom left column, I am the Lord. According to the Midrash, God has two attributes, justice represented by his name Elohim and mercy represented by the name Adonai, yud Hey vav Hey. Okay, so the JPS, the, this translation of Eitz Chaim, Will um, uh, will differentiate between those names by translating Elohim as God and Adonai as Lord. Okay, so that's how we can see in the English translation that there's a different name in Hebrew: Elohim and Adonai. So um, yes, so let me let me just pause there to point out that the, according to the rabbis, not not based on anything that, that comes out from the Torah itself, the rabbis say that there are these two major attributes of God, that is a God of justice and a God of mercy are represented by these two different names. God has many attributes, uh, which gets into a whole different theological discussion, which I won't get into now, right? We, uh, we attribute to God human emotions and human ideals and values. And we proclaim that God has those values too. Uh, compassion, love, uh, social justice, care, nurturing, healing, all those that we think are positive aspects that we try to um, that we try to fulfill in our own lives, we say how much more so God has these attributes too. The major attributes for the rabbis that God has are represented by these two most common names of God, either Elohim or Adonai Yudhe Vavhe. 
Okay, anytime we see Yud Hey Vav Hey, it's pronounced Adonai. Sometimes it's written out as a double Yud. Sometimes it's written Yud Hey Vav Hey. Depends what edition of a prayer book you're using, what edition of a Chumash you're using, either one, Elohim or Adonai. So for, for the rabbis, uh, could, um, so, um, so Howard is asking, could this name change signify a different conversation at a later time? It doesn't seem to be at a later time. It seems from the context, Howard, even though it's the, the next week's power portion, it seems to be that uh, it's happening at the same time. The question for the rabbis is why the change in name? And that, that's for the rabbis, the question is, takes on deeper meaning because God wrote the Torah. So why would God change God's name? For scholars who say that Moses wrote the Torah or other people wrote the Torah, the question still is, why did the editor change God's name here? So that's why I'm, we're, we're going to delve into the commentary in a moment. Yes, Carl. Um, so, you know, whenever I see El Shaddai or different names for God, uh, it makes me want to look up all the names. And I see that, that we attribute, what, seven names? There are 70 names of God. 70? 70. 70. Oh, yes. Wow. Okay. I read wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now there's so just, is each an attribute or right. each represents a different attribute of God. That's yes. That's how that's just how the rabbis understand it. Some of these names of God are like you like you point out El Shaddai. God is God is uh, introduced in the book of Genesis as El Shaddai, but also Elohim and also Yudhe Vavhe are names of God in the book of Genesis. Mostly in the Torah, it's Elohim. Uh, and Adonai, uh, mostly, uh, aside from the El Shaddai back in Genesis. Uh, it's only the rest of the Bible that we see God uh, addressed by the prophets in different names. And then the rabbis themselves add uh, different names for God as well. Um, like Moses prays to God when in the book of Numbers, when Miriam uh, is afflicted with, when his sister Miriam is afflicted with this skin leprosy. And Moses has this beautiful five Hebrew word prayer, El na rifa na la, please God, heal her, please. So rifa, heal, the, the Hebrew name Raphael, Raphael, comes from Resh Pe Aleph, the word for doctor, Rofe. Resh Vav Pe Aleph, all from that word Rifa to heal. So God is a healer. So because God is addressed uh, to heal Miriam, so one attribute of God is God as healer. So uh, we see these different attributes in the daily weekday Amida and the, the 13 middle prayers of the Amida asking God to do different things. Those different things that we're asking God to do reflect different attributes of God's um, persona, so to speak. Okay, but the major, the two major ones for the rabbis that appear in the prayer book that are reflected on the high holidays are justice and mercy. And for the rabbis, it's, it's a discussion about how does God rule the universe? Does God rule the universe with mercy or does God rule the universe with justice? Okay, so if God rules the universe only with justice, then none of us would be alive, according to the rabbis, because we would be punished for every single action that we do, uh, no, for every single slight mistake that we make in our lives, we will be punished. And for the rabbis, if God only ruled the universe and specifically this world with justice, then it would be a world that would be constantly damaged, a, a, a humanity, a human society that would be constantly on edge. And so for the, this is just how the rabbis understand how the world works. For the rabbis, then the um, 
the, the, uh, the idea is that there is an attribute of mercy as well that God has, and that's the only way for the universe to survive. And we access the attribute of mercy, this, this uh, name of God as being Adonai, uh, in order to offset the harsh, strict, black and white nature of justice. And when we pray to God, when we um, uh, repent of our actions, then we are appealing to God's mercy. And on the high holidays, we're asking for God to sit on the throne of mercy as opposed to the throne of justice. And in that way, ensure that we will survive another year. Uh, so uh, Jan is asking me, are these two qualities related to the traits of Chesed and Gevura? Okay, so what Jan is referring to there is, by that question is uh, Jewish mysticism. There are 10 sefirot, 10 uh, like layers of, uh, that uh, are between uh, God's realm and, uh, and the human realm. And we access these 10 spirot uh, to try to climb this ladder to get into God's realm. Jan, that's all I can say about it. I really don't know. Uh, I'm, not an, uh, I'm by no means an expert on Jewish mysticism. Um, and I have no idea, uh, really, uh, you know, chesed, gevura, uh, I, I can't, bina, um, the, uh, the, I, I don't even know all the names of the ten spirot, and I, you'd have to, you'd have to ask uh, a, a rabbi with a more Hasidic bent to understand how the these how God's names of Elohim and Adonai re, uh, relate to any uh, or all of the ten spirot. I, 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 I can't answer that. I, I really don't know. Um, so um, that so, so the uh, the commentary below the line continues now with this just by presenting to us this. So when the first question we say just as as we are are reading the text, and whether we had last week's verse in mind or not, even this first verse raises the question. Why are two names of God presented differently here in the text? If God is introducing God's self to Moses at the end of verse two, Ani Adonai, I am Adonai, why does it be why does the verse begin Vayadaber Elohim? Right? That's that's just the question we should ask stylistically. If you're just writing a narrative, and you're saying God spoke to Moses, saying to him, I am God, which we can translate it this way, why would you change the name of God in that sentence? If God introduces God's self as Adonai, why doesn't the verse be consistent and say, Vaida bear Adonai el Moshe, Vayomer elav ani Adonai? That's the way it should be written. It would make total sense to be written that way. It doesn't make sense to say Vayedaber Elohim El Moshe Vayomer Elav Ani Adonai. The fact that it does say this then raises the questions, like I said before, it's glaring. Darshani, interpret me. Why is God's name changing here? If God, Especially if God wrote the Torah. If God's writing this, why would God say in narrative form, Oh, remember that time that I spoke to Moses here? God spoke to Moses. Well, it should, it should be. I don't know. So that's why the rabbis are asking the question, what's the point of having Elohim first and saying, Ani Adonai? Okay, so the, um, this verse, so I'm at the fourth to last line. 
on the bottom left column on 351, this verse would seem to represent a conflict within God in which the attribute of justice would chastise Moses for seeming to lose faith, right? That's um, the Elohim is the uh, justice, right? Uh, so in other words, losing faith because in last week's portion, Moses is going to God and saying to God, remember the end of chapter five, um, uh, why did you bring harm upon this people? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt worse with this people and still you have not delivered your people. So why? Moses is coming to God asking, why are you doing this, God? Why you, why'd you bother to send me if you're not helping me fulfill my mission? And why are you making it worse for the people? So perhaps God is first presenting God's self to Moses as Elohim to say to, with a slap on the face, how dare you for talking to me with such chutzpah. And, and uh, I'm talking to you as parent to child. This is not the way to talk. That's one idea the rabbis are saying. And the, uh, the, the top right column now, why have you waited while so many have suffered and died? When the the redemption occurs, it'll be too late for them, right? This is the uh, elaborating on the questions from the end of chapter five. Elohim, the divine attribute of justice, wants to strike at Moses for speaking thus, but the attribute of mercy speaks out to him, right? The end of verse two, I am Adonai, and saves him, realizing that he was speaking in that tone on behalf of people who have suffered so much for so long. In other words, God allows Moses' chutzpah to, uh, uh, to go unpunished and allows Moses to be upset with God. And God allows the mercy side of God to take control. Because if the justice part of God were to appear here only then Moses would be punished right here and the whole mission would come to an end before it even began. That's what the rabbis are suggesting in this Midrash right here about the point of Elohim first and then Adonai, which is an interesting idea about, it's, it's, it's a lesson not just about Moses's character and how he, of all the prophets in the history of of, of uh, biblical history was able to speak to God in such a forthright, honest, and brutal way. And that God allows it because God knows Moses is saintly enough in personality and character to be able to speak to God in this way. And that perhaps this is a lesson for us regular people, no matter what generation is reading the Torah, and the rabbis are writing this midrash for, for people in their generation and every generation to understand, I'll get to your question in a second, Susan, um, that uh, we as human beings need to be careful in how we approach God. We should not take Moses's example and speak to God in a a chutzpahdik kind of way. We need to speak to God in a gentle uh, kind of way. Uh, it's good to see you, mom and dad. I was a little bit concerned about uh, where you were. I didn't remember if you had told me you were gonna be coming late or not. Anyway, don't unmute yourself. You'll, you'll tell me at the end of class uh, about all that, but it's it's good to see you. So we, uh, we're we still on the, on the below the line of, of page 351. Um, on uh, Elohim and Adonai in the first verse of Va'era. Um, so, uh, in other words, what the, what the rabbis are saying here is from Elohim and Adonai, they're learning this, uh, they're teaching this lesson about how we are supposed to speak to God. That we need to understand that God is mainly Elohim and that we need to approach God 
as, as Elohim, that we need to be careful, we need to be wary, uh, so that when we approach God, we better be have good character, and we better speak the right way, because we, we can't count on God reverting to the Adonai part. Um, so, uh, uh, so uh, Susan adds to this with the question, so is, is uh, uh, could it be that, that God wants to underscore the unique relationship uh, God will be having with Moshe? So God is narrating to the rest of us as Elohim because we are not on the same level as Moshe. That, that is part of it, except that this is the only time in the Torah because from now on, it will be via the Ber Adonai El Moshe. Every other time that God speaks to Moses, it's via Ber Adonai. Uh, this is the only time it's via Ber Elohim. So that's another thing that adds to because the rabbis uh, uh, assume that we all have read the Torah already, so that that will also stick in our mind. Wait a second. God always says via Ber Adonai El Moshe Lemor. Why is it via Ber Elohim? Right, because we have Vayda Ber Adonai back at the end of chapter five. Why is it Vayda Ber Elohim, and then reverting to Adonai and stays Adonai for the rest of the time? So that's another thing to add to this. So that's that's uh, so um, yeah. Okay. So the the paragraph ends the the on the top right uh, below the line on three fifty one. This is the last time that the divine name Elohim justice appears in any speech of God to Moses. Henceforth, it'll always be yod heh vav -Hey, Adonai, mercy, right? Yeah, so I had read this ahead of time. So a modern Midrashic interpretation, why did God speak to Moses exclusively in the name of the attribute of mercy from this moment on? Okay, right? So the one and only time Elohim here, but from now on by the bear Adonai, hearing Moses' concern for those who would not live to see the liberation from slavery, God declared, I cannot judge this man. He is as righteous a judge as I. Therefore, I will speak to him only with the voice of mercy, for the burden of caring for the Israelites is so great, and only Moses is merciful enough to do it. Right? Again, assuming that we've read the rest of the Torah already a few times, we know that Moses several times in the Torah prays on behalf of the people to God so that God would spare the people from punishment, from the golden calf, from the incident with the spies, for him, for his own self to try to get into the land of Israel. So he always, he, he frequently prays to God on behalf of the people, people who don't necessarily deserve to be prayed for. And if Moses is merciful to them, then God, the Midrash is saying God will be merciful and appear in the merciful attribute to Moses. Another modern Midrashic interpretation to the patriarchs, I revealed myself as a nurturing, mothering God. Some suggest that Shaddai may be related to the word Shaddaiim, breasts. So El Shaddai in uh, Genesis, as God uh, was referred to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, El Shaddai, that's a mothering, nurturing kind of way. Uh, and then my relationship to them was that of a parent to a child, encouraging and forgiving, making few demands. But with this man, Moses, I will speak face to face as one adult to another. I will reveal to him my personal intimate name, yod heh vav -Hey. So that's another idea. Like why did God change God's name from El Shaddai to Adonai? And here it's a more sophisticated spiritually sophisticated, theologically sophisticated relationship. Moreover, because Moses defends the cause of the Israelites so passionately, I, God, will show this side of my nature to them as well. And you shall know that I, Adonai, am your God who freed you from the laborers of the Egyptians, as if God is speaking to the people in verse 7, just five more verses from, from where we are, God of your fathers is the God of Genesis. Uh, yod heh vav -Hey is the God of Exodus. That's another idea too. That uh, perhaps, um, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Elohe, uh, right. The God of your ancestors is also, uh, is how God is referred to in, in um, 
to the people, but also um, uh, to the family, to I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's family. It's God of your fathers, but here it's now a, a more global spiritual idea of the name of God. Okay, so all of that just from this uh, not so careful reading. I mean, even if we're not paying that close attention to every single word and every single vowel in every word, we notice the change in name. And all of this is related to that idea of why, why the change of name from Elohim to Adonai, okay? Now, another aspect uh, uh, that I wanted to share is based on the, uh, the beginning part of uh, below the line here on 351 and uh, related to just this context here, like why does it have to take so long for the people to be free from Egypt? Um, so let's, let's just look at the beginning, the, the left side here below the line. In this Parsha, Pharaoh continues his, ref his refusal to grant the Israelites their freedom. God threatens to harden Pharaoh's heart so that only after several terrible plagues will he relent. Uh, Moses and Aaron do not succeed in impressing Pharaoh and his court magicians with their wonders. The first seven of the 10 plagues are called down on the Egyptians. That's what, what we'll read in this portion, seven of the 10 plagues. The, the, the last three are in next week's portion. The confrontation between Moses and Aaron on the one hand and Pharaoh, on the other, between God's emissaries and those who defy God, becomes sharper. Even Pharaoh's new order that the slaves gather their own straw for making bricks fits this process of escalation. The situation for both the Egyptians and the Israelites must come, become unbearable to overcome the tendency of both sides to maintain the status quo. So, but, but it'll get to the question that's in the next paragraph, in other, which is a question that 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 is uh, that that has um, perplexed readers, commentators for the centuries. If God is all powerful, God is all powerful and all knowing, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, and all present, omnipresent, the three omnis that God is, why then? Do we need the 10 plagues? If God is so powerful and God is, can perform miracles, why can't the Israelites be freed just like that? Why does God have to, so again, assuming that God wrote the Torah and God is behind all these actions, what is the point of Moses and Pharaoh playing this game which impacts the lives of the entire nation of Egypt, both the Egyptians and the Israelites. And with so many, with property being destroyed, with uh, natural resources being destroyed, right? Blood and frogs from the river Nile, the main river, uh, the source of water for all of Egypt. Why were natural resources destroyed? Why were why was property, land and property destroyed? Hail, lice, animals were killed, animal disease, all of that locusts come. And why were people killed, right? Uh, and afflicted, boils and the plague of the firstborn. Why did all of that have to happen? So it's, it's a major theological question that rabbis and commentators have had in uh, trying to understand right? The role of God in the universe. If God is behind everything, why is God doing it that way? Okay, which we can ask in modern times too, right? If God is behind the scenes, why the Holocaust? Okay, that's the ultimate question to ask when you have this traditional understanding of God's role in the world. Why did 6 million Jews have to die? What did they do wrong to deserve such horrific punishment? And why did the Jewish community need, and the world need to be punished by Hitler uh, 75, 80 years ago? That, that's, that's a question to ask. The question about the exodus of Egypt is the question about the Holocaust. Or you can ask it even more simply. Why are we, why, 
why are some people afflicted with disease and other people not? Why, um, why do hurricanes happen? Why, right? Why was Louisiana uh, punished with hurricane after hurricane this hurricane season? Why did volcano? Why do volcanoes erupt? The same questions that you ask about this. But if you dare to say in a non-traditional way that God is not active in our lives, then it raises the question then what is God and what is God's role in our life? In other words, it becomes then a matter of perspective that we have on events that happen around us. We could say that it's as if God is acting in our lives, or as if God is not acting in our lives. In other words, if a bless, if something positive happens in our life, we could say it's as if we are being blessed by God. And that just adding as if to it changes the whole dynamic of our understanding of God's role in our life and God's role in the universe. So with a traditional understanding uh, that the rabbis have of the role of God in the story here. And that's really the whole idea, the whole idea of the Haggadah and in, in around the Seder table and why Moses' name does not appear in the entire Haggadah is to emphasize the role of God in the story and not the role of people in the story that, uh, and how God works miraculously behind the scenes for those who believe in God and for those who deserve God uh, to act mercifully for them. That's the whole traditional understanding of the story here. But still the question is why? Why would God want Egyptians to die in order for uh, Israelites to be free? Okay, so that's the, the second paragraph then on the page begins to address that. Why is it necessary to prolong the process of liberation? It is not enough that the Israelites be freed. That might mistakenly be seen as an act of magnanimity on Pharaoh's part. They must be freed in such a way that they, the Egyptians and all the nations of the world will understand that it was God's doing, not Pharaoh's goodwill. Parentheses, this is important, not so much to burnish God's reputation but to establish the principle that it is unacceptable for one human being to reduce another human being to slavery, that freedom is the will of God and not the choice of a despot. So one possible understanding of why we need this whole process to play out in the way it does is to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was God's doing that the people left Egypt and not Pharaoh's do. That, uh, in other words, we should never be left in a position to be thankful to Pharaoh for our freedom from Egypt, and that, that which we would be tempted to do, possibly, if Aaron, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, let my people go, and he said, okay, without the need for 10 plagues, without the need for damage to natural resources and other resources of the land. If Moses had just said, if Pharaoh had just said yes, then maybe we would be thanking Pharaoh in our prayers for our freedom and not be thanking God. I, that's possibly a cop-out on this whole theology, but it's one possible way of understanding uh, the story. So uh, I want to look at one more comment, unless we have... Uh, uh, anybody else has a question or comment to ask in the chat or uh, to unmute yourself to ask a question, but I want to turn to page. Um, let's, let's keep on reading uh, verses three to eight. And va'era um, el Avraham, I'm going to read in Hebrew and translate. I was, uh, I showed myself, God is saying, to Abraham, el Yitzchak ve'el Yaakov ve'el Shaddai, I showed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, Ushemi Adonai, and my name Adonai, Lo no dati lahem. I did not let them know uh, that name Adonai. Vigam, verse 4, Vigam hakimoti et itam. I also established my covenant with them. 
which included Latet Lahem at Eretz Canaan to give to them the land of Canaan at Eretz Medurehem, the land of their dwelling, Asher Garuba, that they dwelled in. The Gamani Shamati, and I also heard at Naakat B'nai Yisrael, the anguish, uh, the cry, uh, the sigh of the people of Israel, Asher Mitzrayim Avidimotam, that uh, by which Egypt was uh, forcing them into servitude, Vaeskor Ebriti, and I remembered the covenant, that is, they have to be back in Israel, uh, and that Israel is their homeland, they will have to get them out of Egypt. Lachain, verse 6, and more leave Nei Israel. Therefore, say to the, the children of Israel, Ani Adonai, I am Adonai, Vehotseti Etchem, Mitachat Sivot Mitzrayim, I will bring you out uh, from under the uh, sufferings of Egypt. It says here the labors of the Egyptians, the sufferings of Egypt. Vehitzalti Etchem, Meavodatam, I will save you from their. Uh, servitude or labor, uh, slavery. The ga'alti, the ga'alti etchem bizro and the and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, uvishfatim gedolim, and in great chastisements. It's translated here. Seven, the lakachti etchem li la'am, and I will take you for me as a people or a nation. Bahaiti Lachem Lelohim, and I will be uh, to you a God, Viadatem, and you will know Kiani Adonai Elohechem. I am the Lord your God, Hamotzi Atchem, who brings you out. It's like Hamotzi Lechem in Haaret, the same Hamotzi who brings forth bread from the earth, who brings forth you, Mitachat Sivot Mitzrayim, from under the sufferings. Of Egypt. One more verse. The Heveti etchem el haaretz, and I will bring you to the land. Asher nasati et yadi la tetota, which uh, over which I stretched my hand to give to you. Li Abraham, li Tzach, li Yaakov, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ben atati ota lachem, and I gave it to, and I will give it to you. I will give it the land to you. Mo rasha as an inheritance. Ani Adonai, I am Adonai. There are a couple of verbs here, five specifically, that are important uh, that I want to look at below the line, but before that are also important and related to the Seder. So we have from verses six through seven, we have the Hebrew words hotseti, hitzalti, Ga'alti, Lakakti, verse 7, and verse 8, Heveti. Five words, five active verbs that show what God is doing to save the people of Israel from Egypt. Hotseti, I bring you out. Hitzalti, I save you. Ga'alti, I redeem you. Lakakti, I take you. Heveti, I bring you. Okay? So five verbs there represent, anybody know what this has to do with the Seder? What do these five words have to do with the Passover Seder? I'll ask you that. Anybody know? Any, what, what, what is the connection of these five words to the Passover Seder? Saul, so, you're, you're, uh, yeah, I know, I know you're trying to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Uh, when we drink the wine. Yes, very good. So now we have four cups of wine at the Seder. Okay, so there, but there are five words. So what's the fifth? What's the fifth word related to? Carl, right you? Well, you have to unmute yourself. I can't hear you. You got to unmute yourself. Is that for Eliyahu? That's right. Elijah's cup. That's exactly right. So the the. Uh, uh, is there a connection of the, the Zoroa outstretched arm to the bone on the Seder plate? Uh, yes and no. It's a nice jan. It's a nice homiletical connection, but no. The shank bone on the Seder plate, which is called Zoroa, is, is specifically related to the pastoral land that was offered. 
and a roasted egg on the Seder plate is related to the regular holiday sacrifice that would be brought to Passover. So they, these five words, though, were the, were the source for the rabbis of why we have four cups of wine at the same Okay, so at, to represent this, and, and some rabbis thought that there should be five cups of wine. Other rabbis thought, no, four cups of wine. The compromise was, okay, we'll have a fifth cup of wine that we're not going to drink from, and that'll be the, the cup for Elijah, because that's the fifth cup anyway, the fifth word, the Heveti, well, we're in exile, uh, traditionally understood. I mean, we have we have the ability now to live in the state of Israel. We choose not to be. But the traditional religious idea is that we're in exile and that when the Messiah comes, we'll have no choice but as Jews will be brought to the land of Israel uh, by force. <laughs> but we'll be willingly wanting to do that because everybody will be brought to the land of Israel at that time. Uh, and um, so uh, since we're not there yet, and the rabbis in talking about and, and determining the Seder, the Daf Yomi um, page of study of Talmud a day uh, is in the tractate Pes uh, Pesachim right now. Page 53 was today's page. The, the last chapter of Pesachim talks about the Seder. And, um, and it ends with that because there's a, there's a messianic redemptive idea. We, we remember the exodus from Egypt, but that's, and just as God took us out of Egyptian bondage, so too someday we pray with same fervor and, and faith that God will bring the Messiah and bring us out of the exile. And so the, uh, the majority of rabbis thought we shouldn't have that fifth cup of wine because the fifth cup representing bringing us back to the land of Israel, even though the rabbis of the Mishnah were living in Israel itself, they were under Roman occupation and Roman persecution and oppression. Uh, and the Romans had destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. So it's not a full process of Heveti yet. And so that's why the rabbis agreed um, for the most part, that the fifth cup should be the cup for Elijah, representing that we're not drinking from that cup. Nobody drinks from that cup until the Messiah comes. So perhaps if we have a Passover Seder and the time of the Messiah, there'll be a bracha to recite for that fifth cup of wine and we'll, and we'll drink from that. So what I wanted to uh, refer to, besides those five verbs and how they relate to five cups of wine at the Seder table, is also how, how it's translated and it's the process of uh, liberation. So the, I, I translated Hotseti as bring you out, and then Hitzalti save you, Gaalti redeem you, uh, Lakachti take you, and heveti uh, bring you, bring you to, as opposed to hate safety, bring you out. So the English translation has, I will free you and deliver you, redeem you, <clears throat> take you and bring you into the land. Okay, so those are what those five verbs are. And so below the line here on 352, the stages of, these are the stages of redemption. I will free you from physical enslavement in Egypt. So that's just the physical state, like getting the shackles off of our hands. I will deliver you from the psychological mindset of being a slave. So it's one thing to have the shackles off. It's another thing to be psychologically, to psychologically have the shackles off, okay? You can still be enslaved in temperament, even without having the shackles on because it's been ingrained in your personality to be slave-like. Okay, so I will free you with the, from the shackles. I will free you psychologically from being a slave, which might persist even after you have been physically liberated. I will redeem you so that you will thank, think of yourselves as free people. So psychologically, uh, you're free, but then you, you extend that to the whole community. We all deserve to be uh, free people, 
then I will take you into a special, special relationship with me, for that is the ultimate goal of your liberation, right? So having the shackles off, having the, the, the psychological shackles off, becoming community, but becoming community in faith with God, right? So that's the fourth step is understanding that we can only be free when we have a relationship with God. And finally, I will bring you into the land, which I swore to give Abraham. And that faith becomes actualized and the best way actualized in the land of Israel. So the process of freedom leads to a full, rich relationship with God that is fully embodied in the land of Israel. That's the traditional understanding of what, of how we picture uh, uh, Judaism. Judaism is pictured as a triangle with God at the top, uh, the people of Israel and the land of Israel at one corner and the Torah at another corner. Okay, so our relationship to God and it and this is a dynamic relationship. Kind of picture the, um, the, the logo for recycling, which has like, uh, you know, the same kind of triangle, but it has arrows on it. You know, the recycling symbol, if something is eligible for recycling, it's a triangle with, uh, with arrows all around it. That's really uh, also a picture of what Judaism is. It's interactive, um, where all points of the triangle are, are dependent on all other points of the triangle. So that here, the process of freedom really represents our relation, our ultimate relationship with God. We need, we are, we are free, uh, and we are fully actualized as human beings when we have a relationship with God, which is, and that relationship is defined by the Torah, but that is global Torah, that is the whole system of Jewish life. And that all of it can be fully actualized only because there are some aspects of Jewish life that can only be lived in uh, the land of Israel. So here, uh, this is what the, um, the below the line commentary is, is suggesting here that um, if we go on only there in the land of Israel where they have the duty and opportunity to translate the ideals of the Torah into the realities of daily life and fashion the model of society from which all nations will be able to learn. The promise of a land of their own is the Torah's ultimate promise. The threat of being cast out of that land is the ultimate punishment. It's not enough to remove the burden of slavery. They must also have the proper circumstances that will permit them to flourish as God's people. Right, so um, these are the uh, comments. Uh, yes, the, uh, yes, Arnie, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, absolutely, the arrows are going both ways. Uh, right, the, the, yes, they are, they are double-pointed arrows not arrows pointing in one direction, which makes it seem to be circular, but it's, it's an interactive. It can go either, it, it, it constantly goes in both directions uh, 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 throughout the triangle. So we, in other words, uh, you need, you, without, so that, so that triangle is a traditional understanding of uh, and definition of what it means to be Jewish. Um, if you take out one of the corners, you're not really a normative, like, uh, so let me just uh, very simply do this in the last five minutes we have. So there is a branch of Judaism known as humanistic Judaism. And humanistic Jews are atheists, but they use Jewish values to guide their life, but not God. So that's not a traditional, humanistic Jews are not, I'm not saying they're not Jewish, I'm saying they don't live by a traditional definition of Judaism because they don't have God in their lives. And then this also, this is not to denigrate humanistic Jews. It's just for the point of explaining this, this idea. Uh, Reform Jews who take Torah, that one corner of the triangle, as an option are also not traditional definition of Judaism. So because if you say that Torah, living that those aspects of Jewish ritual and practice are optional, 
then that takes out a whole aspect of a definition of what it means to be Jewish. You can also argue, you take out the land of Israel part of the triangle, that uh, which some people have that who, the Jews who are anti-Zionist um, and are like, there are many American Jews who have 100% loyalty to America and have no interest in being loyal to Israel in any way at all. That also is not a, again, I'm not denigrating them. I'm just saying there are absolutely, all of these people are Jewish. Just saying that traditional definition of Judaism, it, it doesn't fit. So the traditional definition incorporates all of this. You need God, a relationship to God. You need to understand Torah and incorporate Torah in your life, the Jewish values and practice and ritual in your life. And you need to identify as part of the people of Israel and, and with a, an understanding that the land of Israel is our home. So um, we'll, end, uh, we'll end today with, and, and with Arnie's point, with those arrows, they are constantly in motion and constantly in relationship with one another. All right. So... Have a good day, everybody. Uh, it's good to see everyone. You can unmute yourselves. Johnny Yashikawa. Uh,